Good morning and welcome to this Lord's Day. Trust that the Lord has been gracious to you as he has been to me. Let me invite you to pray with me as we begin our service. Father, we are grateful to you for this Lord's Day. We do ask that as we come to worship you, grant us ability to do so faithfully, to do so sincerely, and to do so willingly. We ask that we will truly worship you in truth and in spirit. Grant us your special presence this morning, each one of us in our places of gathering. We continue to plead that our Father, soon we will meet as a physical body together because you will have brought the circumstances under which we are to a level where such meetings would be possible. We ask, therefore, that you would hearken to our cries and that you answer our prayer, particularly regarding this COVID-19 situation. Commend each and every family, each and every person worshiping with us today that our God you cause them to experience your goodness, your favor, and your blessings. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me quickly invite you to some notices. And uh, these, particularly if you're listening and you're not a member of Undola Baptist Church, these are particularly directed uh, to the members of Ndola Baptist Church, some uh, to all of us that are listening. The first is the announcement that has been going on for some time, the need to add to the diaconate. Your responsibility and mine is to pray that we will include or add to the diaconate men that are qualified and that men that will contribute to this office effectively. Therefore, pray for the addition to the diaconate, but also make proposals, make recommendations of the men you would like to be elected as deacons of Undola Baptist Church. Please do make proposals. If you do not, you surely can't blame anyone if the men you're thinking of joining the team are not included. So pray for the addition to the deacon's office and do make proposals for the same. Secondly, if you know anyone who has not been listening to the online services like this one, for one reason or another, for any other challenge, please do communicate to any of the elders. We will seek to take a steps that would help them to join us. The announcement is also there on WhatsApp, and I've been making it for some time. Please, if you know anyone that has been unable because of some challenge or the other to listen to the, our online services, please do communicate to any of the elders, uh, particularly to me. Thirdly, let's continue to pray for our brothers and our sisters that have not been well, some for some time now and others in the recent past. Uh, let's pray that the Lord will undertake for them and heal them. Let's particularly pray for our brother, Mr. Sawila, who has been taken ill uh, in the recent uh, months or so. Those would be the notices, and if any would need to be made, they will be posted on our platform. Let me, at this point, invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. 
I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, was caught up to the third heaven. When it was, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no man is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than, as, than is warranted by what I do or say. Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let me, for purposes of focus, read out to you verse 7 to 9 again, which is the portion of our focus for preaching this morning. Verse 7 to 9 of Second Corinthians 12. Verse 7, Or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. This morning, God's grace, sufficient for your every need and situation. God's grace, sufficient for your every need and situation. Well, let's pray together again. Father, we do ask that as we reflect on your word, we plead that you bless the preaching of your word this morning. Cause us to be strengthened, to be comforted, to depend on you, irrespective of what we're going through as families, as individuals, as a local church, as a nation, and the world. Oh, we do ask that may these words of the Apostle Paul, the experience of a thorn in the flesh, because of gloriously experienced revelation to your servant, we do pray that from that situation, from that example, we will find comfort, find a basis on which to look to God and plead that his grace that is sufficient may be experienced by each one of us, and that this will be experienced in reality and in a biblical way. So bless our God. We plead again the preaching of your word, and bless the listening to the same. Be pleased to save, be pleased to rebuke, be pleased to call to holiness, be pleased, our Father, to call to commitment and dependence on God even more. Do this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God's grace, sufficient for your every need and situation. 
The passage before us is a well-known passage. And if my memory serves me well, it's a portion we've reflected on before, but focusing primarily on that last phrase in verse 10, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, this morning our focus is on that phrase, my grace is sufficient for you. But we focus on it in the context of the overall section, which really is the third and last division of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, which begins at chapter 10, way down to the end. The Apostle Paul, in dividing this letter by many, uh, argue that it basically places it in three divisions, and what we're dealing with is the last and the third division. And this, in this segment, the Apostle Paul was writing primarily to defend his apostolic office and authority because there had a reason men who called themselves apostles, they are referred to in this section of the letter as super apostles, and who were teaching men and women to question the Apostle Paul's validity office. So they were basically saying, he is not a genuine apostle. We are. And they are called in this letter super apostles. In that context, whatever the Apostle Paul is doing, he is defending his apostolic office, partly because of the nature he was called to the office, and therefore people had questioned whether he truly was simply not an imposter. He was doing this to encourage the whole Corinthian church to continue to respond positively to his ministry as an apostle so as to avoid the consequences of not submitting to genuine biblical apostolic authority and instructions. The Apostle Paul is doing this not simply so that he may argue he is an apostle and he must be respected and all kinds of offerings and homage be paid to him, but he is doing this for the sake of the Corinthians. Because if they do not acknowledge him as God's apostle, they will inevitably not submit to his authority. They will not, as it were, obey his instructions. And if they do not do that and yet is a genuine apostle, they will bear the consequences. So he's doing this to avoid the consequences of not submitting to genuine biblical apostolic authority and instruction. And I'm being deliberate here. He's doing this to avoid the consequences of not submitting to genuine biblical apostolic authority and instruction. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1 to 12, Paul mentions the special visions and revelations that God had granted him. With great restraint, to strengthen further his readers' confidence in his apostolic calling and authority which the false apostles were questioning and causing the saints at Corinth to doubt. All I'm underlining in this explanatory note is this, that why he's telling us, while he is telling us of these extraordinary revelations and visions, he is doing this with great restraint. He is struggling with saying this. Listen to how he does this. Chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, 
Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I'll boast about a man like that, but I'll not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Now, if that's where you stopped, you'd be assuming the Apostle Paul is talking about somebody else. Why is he using the second person pronoun about somebody else, about somebody else? Why is he doing this? He's restraining himself because in verse 6 he tells us, even if I choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain. So no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. In other words, he's saying this, look, I'm hesitant to really say, this was me, this was me, because you may, be, you may misunderstand me. But he's doing this to reinforce that they must view him as he truly is, an apostle of God. But he's doing this with great restraint. And it's in that context that he makes that statement, my grace is sufficient for you because of what God did to humble him to ensure that he's not being celebrated as some iconic, outstandingly unique celebrity of his own class. God gave him a thorn in the flesh. In the context of the thorn in the flesh, he makes that glorious statement as an answer from God regarding his three times praying for that son to be removed. My grace is sufficient for you. God does, beloved, always answer prayer. But sometimes he does so with wise denials because he wants to give something better. Although not necessarily more comfortable. God does always answer prayer, but sometimes he does this with wise denials because he wants to give something better, although not more comfortable. As a careful reflection on the observations in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, underlines. What I'll be doing is make some observations that support the statement that God's grace is sufficient for every need and situation, but also that supports the proposition that sometimes God answers prayers with wise denials basically for something better, but the something better is not always comfortable. It may, from your perspective and mine, be unpleasant. Therefore, the first observation, the thorn in the flesh of the Apostle Paul. The thorn in the flesh of the Apostle Paul. Please remember, this is in reflecting on God's grace, sufficient for your every need and situation. Verse 7. But let's pick up from verse 6. Even if I should choose to boast, <clears throat> I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being becoming conceited or arrogant or proud or overrating myself, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan 
to torment me. Verse 8, three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He gave me a thorn. To keep the apostle from becoming conceited, from becoming too elated, from being arrogant, from being overly self-exhorting because of the surpassingly great revelations, he was given a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan, to torment him. And the question that must be asked was given a thorn in the flesh by who? He's struggling with a strong language. Let's make it soft. Who permitted that the Apostle Paul would be tormented by a messenger of Satan? who permitted that Saul would have a thorn in the flesh. To whom was Paul appealing for this thorn to be removed? Well, according to the text and what is implied, God permitted it. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. Take it away. Notice as we consider the thorn in the flesh of the Apostle Paul, firstly, the reason he was given a thorn in the flesh was for his own good. Was for his own good. Notice I said the following. God does always answer prayer, but sometimes he does so with wise denials because he wants to give something better, though not more comfortable. God gave a thorn, permitted the thorn to be given, a messenger of Satan to torment Saul for Saul or Paul's own good. The thorn was a gracious gift from God, though to Paul it was an unpleasant one. That sounds strange, particularly because of the current Christian preaching and teaching that seems to tell us that all the gifts we get from God, all the things God will permit in our lives are all nice and comfortable and pleasant According to this text, the thorn was a gracious gift. Where am I getting the word gift from? That's what Paul tells us himself, that this was a gift. And if this was a gift permitted of God, well, then James's words are true. That all the good gifts, all that we get from God are good. That's not the same as pleasant by way of experience. Listen to his words. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given. It was given to me as a gift. What was the gift? A thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. And because of the nature of the gift, I wasn't willing to have it for a long time. I pleaded that God may remove it. He refused to remove it. But why was it given for his own good? Notice how Paul describes this gift or his affliction. It is a thorn in the flesh. He calls it a thorn because it was very severe to him. A messenger of Satan to torment or harass or trouble or buffet him. This is not pleasant. But it's still a gift. Please remember we're focusing on God's grace. Sufficient for your every need and every situation. The phrase torment or buffet or harass is in the original 
kolafizo, which means to strike with the fist, give one a blow with the fist. It means to mistreat, treat with violence and with insults or scorn or outrage. That's why he describes it a thorn. It was the thorn in the flesh that Paul was given. But what was the thorn in the flesh? Was it a physical affliction or some external problem, such as a physical illness or infirmity? Was it a spiritual temptation, perhaps, a tendency towards pride or the opposition of Paul's enemies? Was it a temptation attacking the moral purity of the apostle? Well, the simple answer is this. We do not know what the actual thorn was. But what we do know is this, that whatever it was, it was intensely painful, agonizingly unbearable, severely, severely, Tormenting. That's the thorn. Paul himself understood it to be a messenger that came from Satan to frustrate him. Maybe Paul had Job 2 verse 1 to 10 in mind, we don't know, but he describes it as terrible. But from God's perspective, as difficult as it may sound, this was a gracious gift to Paul. This was a gracious gift to Paul. Listen to the reasoning again. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, in order to keep me from becoming arrogant, in order to humble me, in order to make me not think of me more than who I am, in order not to make me proud. In other words, God did this to avoid my falling in some sort of sin that would hurt God and misrepresent God to do that. He gave me this son. This son was intended for good. From God's perspective, was a gracious gift. Was this gracious gift pleasant or enjoyable to Paul? You simply need to read the text. It was not. It was painful. And the prayer that he offered shows us that the Apostle Paul did not enjoy this three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. It was excruciatingly, distressingly, it was awfully painful. Physically, emotionally, and mentally. Nevertheless, God had permitted it and he used it to bring good out of evil. Are you obviously asking, why are you telling us all this? Simply this. Not only the COVID situation. Some people's sufferings are were, were intense way, way intense than this collective experience of COVID and what it brings. Some people have gone under affliction 10 years, come to the Lord, pleaded, asked for prayer with them. They have a physical of affliction. They, they may have a family situation, an economic issue. Wrestling with this for a long, long time. Maybe the Lord has not taken it away. And you're wrestling with the question, why? 
why is God not answering my prayer? Well, the, the answer is simply this, he is. God is answering your prayers, but maybe saying, I won't take this away because there is something better, but it may not necessarily be pleasant, but it's for your good. One of the things, at least I know, I know that you do not necessarily, or sin is not necessarily committed when people go out, but I still know also that a lot of sin is committed as people go out to drink. Have you ever stopped to imagine how much mischief has been stopped by COVID-19? Have you ever stopped to ask how much money has been spared for a better use in the home than on a bottle of castle or chibuku? Have you ever stopped to ask those questions? How some prostitute was avoided because some man didn't go out drinking. Is COVID-19 terrible? Yes, it is. Is it possible that even though it is good, God still may not lift it in a short time to come? Probably. If you've been following current affairs, we've been told recently by the man responsible for the health board in Zambia, Professor Munkonk, I think that's his name, who told us this may be with us for a long time to come. Is this a thorn? Could be. Why should it hang around for a long time? God may have a good reason for it. Be assured that God is at work. Secondly, in our observations, the almighty God's reason for the gracious and pleasant gift of the thorn in the flesh to the apostle Paul, the almighty God's reason for this gift was given to Paul to remind him of his limitations and to keep him humble. We can never and not emphasize this. This cannot be overemphasized. If there is anything COVID-19 has done and every form of affliction and situation that shows our limitations and hurt, it simply shows us that we're not all self-sufficient. If we were, would have come out of those situations yesterday. We are assured in our sicknesses, in our deprivations, frustrations in life, in our places of work, that we limited beings. We need to look out to one that is all sufficient and unlimited. Such a revelation could have made Paul quite a Christian celebrity had he published it. As you read those verses, sometimes I ask, if this was me, exposed to these extraordinary experiences, and God had said to me, don't write about it, I'm not sure I would have been obedient. This is an opportunity for cashing in. Write a book about real experience in heaven. In paradise, do paint a picture for those who are longing to go to heaven. Tell them I've been there. And people love to hear such things even if they are fake. And a lot of it, absolute nonsense. The Apostle Paul being exposed to this genuine experience and listen to the language he uses in the text. Because of these surpassingly great revelations. Surpassingly great revelations. A thorn was given to me. It was given to humble him. To show him that he is limited. To show him that he is not the one to be exalted but God. 
Paul did not want his converts to form an opinion of him based on what they heard about him. He preferred that they do so because of what they saw and heard with their own eyes and ears. I hope as ministers of today, we could learn from the apostle Paul. We seem to major on showing ourselves on how extraordinarily God is using us. Instead of simply calling people to our day-to-day -day lives. That's what the Apostle Paul wanted to happen. Listen to what he says in verse 6. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore in order. I want people to simply observe me for who I am, not based on these extraordinary experiences. The reason God gave him this thorn, again I've stated it, uh, restating it, was for his own good, and for the good of the saints. Some afflictions, not all of them, are basically for God to remind us who we are. We are dependent creatures. We must look to God. And some of the afflictions, God may not bring to an end. because We may need them for the rest of our life. Please hear me, some, not all. Shouldn't we pray that God would remove them? Of course we must. That's what Paul did. It's God's prerogative to answer in the way that he should to those prayers of ours. But he, when he does say to us, I am not removing this, I'm not stopping this, I'm not getting this person out of your life. Please do trust what God is doing, that he's doing it for our good. Our last observation, the Apostle Paul's plea and God's answer to his prayer. The Apostle Paul's prayer and God's answer to that prayer. Notice firstly, the one who was making this intense request. It is the one who had overcome so many dangers, tortures, and other evils. He overcame tough or formidable enemies of Christ. He had driven away the fear of death. He had in detail renounced the world, and yet regarding this son, the apostle agonizes about, and he does so intensely. It's the apostle Paul himself, one who God has used extraordinarily. This son, this son was overwhelming. Notice what a great example Paul lays down about the necessity of prayer even in the most buffeting or bashing situations. Matthew Henry tells us that prayer is a salve or ointment or balm for every soul, a remedy for every malady. And when we are afflicted with thorns in the flesh, we should give ourselves to prayer. One of the things I've observed we do as Christians when we're going through intense suffering, difficulties, a situation haunts us, and things that are brought upon us, sometimes the thing we easily let go is prayer. The Apostle Paul is saying to us in this text, no matter how painful, no matter how agonizing, no matter how complex, no matter how ridiculous sometimes it will appear, he's saying to us, please do not give up on praying to God. Three times, the Apostle Paul tells us, three times. I pleaded. In other words, the worse it became, the more I prayed. Going through a tough situation, please don't give up on prayer. 
It's giving up on the God who answers prayer. Notice the persistence of Paul's praying. Three is employed to denote or signify frequent, regular repetition of the exercise. We must hold on and hold out to prayer until we receive an answer as troubles are sent to teach us to pray, so they are continued to teach us to continue instant or prompt in prayer. It was an intense, urgent, sincere, and specific plea to have the thorn removed. Paul's repeating of the petition to have the thorn removed three times shows how intensely and desperately he wanted God to remove his affliction. At the time he was writing, we're not sure for how long this has been given him, he was still going through this. To going through this, a thorn has been given to me. Three times I pleaded, and God said no. And the reason is, I have something better for you. Let's consider the specific response. God's response to Paul's plea to have the thorn removed was basically no. Listen to the prayer. Listen to the response. Verse 8, three times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Talk about a specific prayer, there it is. Talk about an intense prayer, there is one. Talk about a sincere plea, there it is. Talk about a desperate request, there is one. Talk about a genuine request. We have one. What's the answer? But he said to me. But he said to me, in other words, he said no, but in a context. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm not removing it. Paul, the answer is clear. Now think of the apostle Paul many times. He comes to God. God remove it. The answer is sorry. I'm not doing it because I'm providing something better for you. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And that's why I'm picking up a reflection. God's grace is sufficient for your every need in every situation. God's grace is sufficient for your every need and mind and for your every situation. What we have in these verses is an example or instance of God denying a prayer request because he wanted to give something better, though not more comfortable. The fact that God provided grace does not mean the pain went away. No, grace enabled the Apostle Paul to stand, to continue going, to remain faithful. It enabled the Apostle Paul to be sustained even in the context of much affliction. God answered his prayer by providing grace. Now I know that in our local church, some of you are going through tough times. Sometimes, as you talk to the saints, you'd hope uh, that the supernatural apostolic gifts would be true in me because then I would be pleading with certainty. In the language of the, uh, the apostles, what we have in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. The Lord has chosen not to remove them. But I would like to assure you, his grace is sufficient for you. And notice, I'm deliberately treating COVID-19 as a byway thing, it's important, but the focus is on you as an individual, not only in the context of COVID, in the overall Christian life. There are many 
difficult things we go through and we've been going through even before COVID came, the statement was true. It is still true even in our context. But what is grace that is sufficient in all situations and in every need in this context? Well, grace in this context is God's provision for our every need when we need it. It is the help or assistance or support of the Holy Spirit which comes to us from the unmerited favor of God. This grace ought to be sufficient for the child of God in that it is a sure and invincible, unshakable support. Someone has said that Christians live on promises not explanations. One of the Christian anchor promises in the scripture that God has given them to live on is this one found here in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you. Literally, the verse would read as follows with a little more for sufficient for you is my grace. Sufficient for you is my grace in every situation, for my power in infirmity is perfected. Warren Westby has observed the following regarding this verse. In the Christian life, we get many of our blessings through transformation, not substitution. Sometimes God does meet the need by substitution, but other times he meets the need by transformation. He does not remove the affliction, but he gives us his grace so that the affliction works for us and not against us. The afflictions, the agonies, the anguishes, the sufferings, the miseries, the distresses, the torments, and the pains of life may go on for a long time, sometimes up to the grave, but please children of God, be reminded and be comforted in this promise of God. His grace is sufficient for each one of us. His grace shall endure and will never fail you. God does not always remove our troubles and afflictions, but he always gives us sufficient grace. Grace signifies two things, God's goodwill, God's favor or kindness towards his children. Secondly, God's good work in us, the grace we receive from the fullness that is in Christ our head. From him there shall be communicated that which is suitable and seasonable and sufficient for his members. Christ Jesus understands our case and knows our need and will proportion or ration or suit the remedy to our problem or troubling situation, and not only to strengthen us, but to glorify himself. His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses, and as a result, his grace is manifested, manifested and magnified. You've forgotten everything I've been saying? Remember this. God's grace is sufficient for your every need in every situation. Trust him. Depend on him. Is your situation painful? Oh, certainly. Is grace sufficient? Absolutely. But this is only true if you are a Christian. This is only true if you are a Christian. If you're not God's child, you are on your own. What a miserable situation to be in. Come to Christ and be saved. May you, like the Apostle Paul, be able to say by personalizing these verses, God's grace is sufficient for me. And therefore, you will boast in your weakness. Because in your weakness, God's strength is manifested. May God help you to depend on him. Let's pray together. Father, we ask very specifically this morning, help us to depend on you in our difficult situations. Some 
our sicknesses. Some involve our family members. Some those very close to us. Some are spiritual. Some are marital issues. Some are economic situations. Some just life in general. Some academic. Some of a whole variety. Our God, we pray that whatever the situations may be, the troubles, the problems, maladies of life, may we lift up that promise and apply it to our hearts, experience it in true biblical meaning and reality. Your grace is sufficient for us. We pray this would be true even this period, during this period of COVID-19. May we lift up that promise, declare it, affirm it, and leave it out. Your grace is sufficient for our every need in every situation. Accomplish this in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. May God richly bless you.